Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. But God wants us to all never forget that we're all called disciples. Everybody say disciples. disciples. Now I know that a lot of people don't like this word disciple because it kind of sounds too religious. But the definition of disciple is simply student. We're learners. And how many know that um, if we're learners of God, and I love this, uh, man, I'll tell you, I love these props. <laughs> love, love, love these. Aren't these cool props? This is, this is pretty. So, Rob, Rob, once again, you outdid yourself, man. Thank you so much, <laughs> Rob. Rob did all that. But, but let me explain this because you know what? We don't just put props to be cute. We do props with a purpose. Okay, here's what the Bible says, that you and I, we have the tongue of the learned. That means that with our tongue, we write our destiny. We write our future. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And those who love it, what? Eat its fruit. And so God has given us the ability to begin to write the things that we want to see come to pass. I love this, uh, this Japanese backpack. I'll tell you, this is like in, in Japan. People use backpacks this big. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> like the backpack represents your heart. Everybody say my heart. And how many know that the Bible says that it's out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, but check this out. But it also says that it's out of the heart where all the issues of life flow. And so when you think about this backpack, you have to think about, I wonder what comes out of me whenever I'm going through something. I wonder whether I respond or whether I react. And so our life is like a backpack. And every single one of us through life, we walk through this journey called life. And stuff happens, things happen. And we have to know that whatever comes out is based on what we put in. And we have to come back to the basics of God and start putting in the things that he wants inside of us so that when we face the giants, man, we're responding with a sense of godliness and not a sense of fleshliness. Amen? And then, of course, the ruler. I'm sure many of you are thinking, like, what's the point of the ruler? But how many know that God measures things? Huh? He weighs the heart. God, we should all have a measure of growth in our spirituality. We should all have a measure of growth in our family life. We should all have a measure of growth in everything we do at work, come on, in business, whatever it is, there should be a measure. There should be a measure of your vision, of the goals that you're setting for yourself. Come on, how many of us right now want to lose some measure? Come on, amen. <laughs> Right? We started in, in, in 2019 of January. I'm going to lose 20 pounds. We've gained 40, praise Jesus. Right? So, but God cares about measure. God measures the heart or God weighs the heart. God cares more about the heart than he does about the motive. He wants to know what's, what's the heart. What does the heart say about this situation? So we're going to spend the next few weeks getting back to the basics. And how many know that it's great? We can preach about how to be successful. We can preach about, you know, how to, how to live a better life. We can preach about how we can be, um, you know, more influential. And we can preach about how we can go higher and how we can elevate. You can, listen, all those things, they matter. But how many know that without a God foundation, none of it really matters? And we're going to talk about that foundation today. And I want you to really open your ears to hear. And this message is for all of us. Nobody gets away from this today. We all have fallen in the trap that I'm going to talk about today. And I know that we're going to be blessed by today's message. How many would agree with me that we live in a time where we're indated and indated and indated with information? How many would agree with me? I mean, there's so much information on this earth, it's ridiculous. We have so much sermons, we have uh, so much gifting, we have all kinds of talent, but it's so difficult to come to the truth, though we have all this information. I mean, today you can go on YouTube and get information. You can go on podcasts, get information. You can go to Google, Yahoo, whatever you use, and you can get any information. When you feel sick, you can Google your symptoms, and there's more information. But it's so interesting that as much information that we have on this earth, there is so much more confusion. 
there's so much more confusion. There's so much more um, selfishness. Come on, there's so much more ideology. There's so much more uh, hatred in the world. Just look at our society today. We are a divided country. There's so much division. There's so much strife. There's so much offense. Not only in the world. Let's not just talk about the world. You know where the greatest division and offense come from? The church. The greatest offenses come from church. The greatest dysfunction comes from church. And how are we going to win this world if we are going to continue to stay in this dysfunctional place? So I think we can all agree that, man, yes, we got a lot of information in our time, but there's such a lack of transformation. And, and, and the reason I called this series Back to School is because we need to get back to the basics in order for us not to be confused and lose sight of what God wants to do in our life and also do through our life. But how many know that takes being a student? And some of us have stopped learning. Let's just be honest with ourselves. Some of us got saved, got excited, come on, started growing in our faith, and then for some reason got confused along the way. We started kind of departing from the way. Come on, we started kind of losing the truth. And I know that there is a, we're, we're drowning today in so much, infer, come on, we have, we're drowning in, in, in our own ideas. We're drowning in our own selfishness. We're drowning in our own uh, uh, self-hatred. We're, we're drowning with, with so much stuff. But, but here's the problem. Not only are we drowning in this, but we're starving from truth. And it's how do we come back to truth? How do we get that hunger and that thirst for truth again? And so these next three weeks, you don't want to miss it. Because if you miss it, then you're going to come back the third week. If you miss the second week, and you're going to be a little bit confused. So these next three weeks, don't miss class. Make every single session and watch what God will do. Can I get an amen? amen. The problem we have is this, is that we honor ourselves more than we honor God. We honor our ideas more than we honor God. We honor our feelings more than we honor God. We honor our own truth more than we honor God's truth. And when we start losing that honor for God, then that's when things start getting a little bit confusing. Things start getting a little bit, you know, it's almost like there's a blur that begins to happen when it comes to the things that God is telling us. Like when you come on a Sunday, you're hearing, but you're not really present. Like I'm hearing, I hear you. Y'all got ears, right? But not everyone's hearing in this church and many churches in America, globally. And so just because you're sitting here present today doesn't necessarily mean that you're a student and you're learning and you're growing and you're changing. And so I'm praying that in these next three weeks that we all come together and we're saying, you know what? For the next three weeks, I'm going to be the best student for God that I've ever been in 2019. Can we all agree, agree to that? Amen. So um, when, when you start losing that honor, honor for God, here's what happens. Uh, you start treating God as a common person. And how many know that God is not common? He's an uncommon God. And when you come back to that place of, of, of treating God like he's common, then God's word becomes common to you. And then all of a sudden, God's word is not enough for you. And, and God's word doesn't have the power to heal you, doesn't have the power to deliver you. Why? Because we've treated him so dishonorably that he's just like the next common person that we interact with every single day. But how many know that when we come in the presence of God, he's not common. He's a supernatural powerful God who's ready to heal, deliver, and set free. That's who our God is. But we have to come back to the place of honor. And if there's no honor, listen, you start treating God kind of like second-class information. And God's, God's word is not second-class information. God's word is meant to transform us. God's word, he says, it's the implanted word of God that can change your soul. What's your soul? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's the implanted word. It's the seed that goes deep into your heart that begins to bring the transformation that we need as a church, as a body, as people, as followers, as students of Jesus Christ. And until we start receiving that implanted word, nothing's going to change. Things will stay the same. You can hear all the sermons you want and get an amen, get a shout, get a hallelujah, have a standing ovation. But let me tell you something. That's just information. That information needs to become a form of a seed. That seed needs to go deep into the soil of your heart. And then that heart needs to be watered. 
And the only way you get that water is by the watering and the washing of the word. And without that, there's no transformation. Are you guys here? Okay. So let's stop starving in truth. So let me just tell you this real quick. Just so I can give some practicality, then I'm going to give you some spiritual truth. Okay. When you think about school, you think about students. And there's two types of students, and I'm sure that most of us would relate to this, and, and you know which one you were, or which one you are still if you're still in school. But the first student is the studious student. Let me see all my studious students from back in the days. You were studious. Golly, hardly just two of you? <laughs> it all makes sense now, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It all makes sense. Maybe at 10 o'clock we'll have some studious. Okay, so let, let me give you some, just some, some definition of the studious. The studious is always in class, takes notes, hardly ever misses school, and if they do, they make up the work. Studies every page on the subject by reviewing what they learn to pass the test when it comes. This studious student may not be perfect. They may not get 100% scores on all the subjects they get, but let me tell you something but they're close to it. They get 98%, 97%, and they're always getting a passing grade. That's the studious student. All right, let me hear. You guys want to hear who you are now? Okay, let me hear. This is who I was too. Don't worry about it. I was the struggler. The second student is the struggler. Let me see all of my strugglers in the house. God bless all the strugglers. Thank you, Jesus. It's not just the struggler. It's the procrastinator as well. It's the struggler forward slash procrastinator. Okay, this is who that person is. And I want you to get this because i got to lay the foundation if we're going to kick off, kick off this, this series for the next few weeks because it all is going to tie in after every single message I preach. Okay, so the procrastinator, the struggler, student, pretends that he or she got this. Come on, you got the look. You walk in like you're smart, right? You go to class, you sit down. You know, you pretend you understand what the teacher's saying, right? You're, you even throw a little amen in there. Amen. That's so good, teacher, so good. But it really went like this, right? You, 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 your, your neighbor claps, you're like, okay, I better clap because they're clapping, okay? Is in class, but not always present. Does that sound familiar in church? Is in class, but not always present. On the phone, texting, thinking, what am I going to eat? Hearing your tripa, you know, your intestines, you know, I wonder what I'm going to eat, you know, like... Hardly studies, never takes notes, doesn't ask for help, always makes excuses. Let me see all my excuses. No, don't lift your hand. <laughs> always makes excuses for not being prepared. Oh, it's because. Oh, it's because the dog ate my homework. Oh, it's because. Oh, it's because I was sick. Oh, it's be always making excuses for not growing, always making excuses for not being prepared, always making excuses for not changing your grade. And when the test comes, they fail, and they repeat the cycle all over again. And I know many of us, I know I did, I went to six high schools. I kept repeating the cycle of dysfunction over and over again. And how many know that you can be the struggler and pretend that you got it all together? But how many know that at the end of the day, the grade is going to tell you who you is? I'm in proper grammar, right? We're, we're in school right now. It'll tell you who you really are. It starts telling you that, you know what? You're not prepared. It starts telling you that you're falling behind. It starts telling you that you're not, pro you're not going to progress. It starts telling you that you're not going to go to the next grade level that God wants to take you into. And so I want you to please understand this because if we don't get a practical understanding of what it means to be God's student, right, then we won't have the capacity to have the intelligence and to grow in our spiritual walk and to really take our life and elevate it to the next level that God wants us to go into. Because how many know that God wants to graduate his kingdom? God wants to graduate us from earth to heaven. But how many know that you got to pass the test to get to heaven as well? Heaven ain't free. Let me say that again. Heaven ain't free. The price was paid for, but now the life that we walk is going to be the result of whether or not we make it into heaven. Am, am I speaking to you today? Okay. So um, there's two kinds of spiritual people. Now let's bring it to the spiritual. Okay. 
The first kind is that we have the inner man person. Because I know that we all have two lives that we live. Right now, you either live the inner man, and I don't think we all live 24-7 in the inner man. The inner man is living and walking by the Spirit. But the second man is the what? The outer man. The flesh. It's where most of us live. Why? We live in a world and we operate in this flesh. And so it's not that you're not going to flesh out sometimes. It's going to happen. Has anyone ever ticked you off? Has anyone ever offended you? Right? And so sometimes you're going to be living, trying to live in the spirit while you're also living in the flesh. But you know, at any point of any circumstance or situation that you face, you make the decision, you make the choice, what type of student am I going to be in this circumstance right now? Am I going to be in the spirit or am I going to get into my flesh? And at that point, it's, it's our choice. We choose how we're going to respond. I'm going to flesh out or I'm going to be spirit led. And so let me just kind of explain what the inner man is. The inner man, just like we talked about the, the practical side of students, right? The inner man student knows what he or she needs to be, needs to do, and obeys God regardless of how they feel. That's the inner man. That's the spirit man. The outer man, the fleshly man, the fleshly woman, lives to show what he or she does. Come on, we just like to show. We pretend that everything's cool. We're, we're, we're really struggling, but we want to show the best foot forward, right? How you doing? Praise the Lord, right? But the outside man or the, or the flesh man or the flesh woman reacts by how they feel. And so we do our best to look good outside because we live in a world that is looking, us, looking at us from the outside and not necessarily the inside. But how many know that while everyone is looking at us from the outside, while we pretend to be something sometimes, God is looking on the inside. God is always looking at what's in your heart. That's where God focuses. Nothing wrong with looking good. Nothing wrong with smiling. Nothing wrong with, you know what, being someone that's full of life and excitement. But how many know there's something wrong when you can have all this outer, I look good, feel good, talk good, but on the inside, you're broken, you're angry, you're offended, you're... You know, you feel all these mixed emotions about people and, and, and you feel hatred towards yourself. You know, there's times where you look yourself in the mirror, you cuss yourself out. There's self-hatred. And, and that, that is what we see today in our world, but we also see a lot of that in the church. And so the, the flesh man or the flesh woman is also someone who um, goes through life by just being on cruise control or autopilot. It's almost like you just kind of feel like, well, you know what? Things should just get better if I just go ahead and just keep living. And how many know that's a lie? Things don't get better as you're going through life. If you're living on autopilot as a Christian, as a believer, you're going to stay there for a very long time. That's why it's called autopilot. It means that you have lost control of your life and the flesh is leading you. But how many know to get off autopilot or to get off of cruise control, you got to get back to the spirit. Because the spirit, will lead, the spirit will not do it for you. The Spirit will lead you into all truth. And so God's grading both, of, both the inner man and he's grading the outer man. Both things. Now let's look at some scripture here to break this down. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this. It says, study. Everybody say study. study. And do your best to present yourself to God approved. There it is right there. Study. What does the word study mean? Study. It's that simple. Study. Open your Bible. Right? Study whatever it is you're facing. Come on, wherever you're challenged, you study that area. If you're dealing with sickness, you study scriptures on, on healing. If you're, if you're dealing with lust, you study the scriptures on lust. If you're dealing with, you know, offense, you study the scriptures of offense, etc. Okay, it says, a workman tested. Everybody say tested. Okay, so there's going to be tests in our study. So if you're not studying, what's going to happen when test comes? You're going to fail. Tested by trial, who has no reason to be ashamed. Look at this. Who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully, skillfully teaching 
the word of truth. And how many know that when you don't study, Satan has a reason to put you and me back into shame, guilt, and condemnation. But when you're well-versed, when you're well-studied, you have no shame. When you're not well-versed, when you're not well-studied, when you're not getting into God's word and trying to find out the answers to the problem. And how many know that God gives open book tests? Right? So the answers are God's like, I've given you the answer on how to respond to this situation, but we fail to look at the open book test that we have right there. God's given us every answer to the test, but we get so lazy procrastinating about our situation. We're waiting. When are you going to move? God's, God's like, you're the procrastinator, not me. I've given you the answers to all the tests, all the trials, all the challenges, but you keep failing to look in. You keep failing to study to show yourself approved. And so how does that happen? You just cruise through life. You just think, what's well, it's, it, it's going pastor said it's going to get better, so it's going to get better. No, it gets better when we get better at getting in that book. And outside that book, we're not going to get better. So we can't keep pretending. Okay. Now, let's look at another verse. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says this. We don't want Satan to outsmart us. See, every time that we fall back into shame, guilt, condemnation, the only re- you can't just blame it on Satan. We gave him permission to outsmart us. Because how many know that he's not that smart? And so when you start falling into that trap of feeling not worthy, feeling like, man, I'm not good enough. The only reason is because you lack to study and then Satan starts outsmarting you. He says, he says, and we know how he does his evil work. How many know that Satan is doing his work very well? He's so good at that, isn't he? Man, he's good at three things. Guilt, condemnation, and shame. Those are his three subjects and he studies that bad boy. But the only way that he has power to put that into our life is when we lack knowledge. And when you lack knowledge, you'll always fall back into that same cycle, that same trap. And how many know this? God will test you, but Satan will tempt you. God will test you. So right now, maybe you're in a season of test. Maybe it's not the devil. Maybe right now you have the most horrible, you know, boss in the world. Maybe right now you're going through the most difficult time with your child. Maybe right now you're facing some really crazy challenges in your relationships. And you're thinking, oh, it's just the devil. Well, how many know that it's not everything is the devil? I think we give him too much credit. He's, he, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have all power. He has some power. God has all power. And so maybe right now, whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you're going through, just maybe you're just being tested. And you got to pass that test. And if you don't pass that test, guess what? You're going to retake that test. And I don't know about you. I hate retaking tests. See, but the struggler, the struggler doesn't ask for help. The struggler keeps repeating the same cycle and falls back into that same trap. You know what the cycle is or what the problem is? We go from sin to cycle to setback. From sin to cycle to setback. God delivers us from our sin. We start doing good, but somehow we default back to our cycle. Come on, the things that you got delivered from, the things that God healed you from, we somehow come back to that cycle of of. of dysfunction, that cycle of, of offense, that cycle of slander, that cycle of, of gossip, that, that cycle of not trusting God, that cycle of self-hatred, that cycle of I don't like you. And then it sets us right back to what? Sin. You got this? I hope they put that. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. So everybody say, we got to pass this test. So quickly now, I want to talk about the first test of these next three weeks. We're going to talk about love. Everybody say love. love. And how many know that the love walk is not always easy? Because there's some ugly, annoying people in this world. Especially in the church. That's true. There's so many annoying, ugly people. People, listen, people, they love you on the outside. But when they leave, on the inside, man, that's what matters. Anybody can pretend on the outside, like, oh, mm, I love you, I'm for you, yay. But then they walk away, and it's really, what do you say when they're no longer in your presence? That is the true measure of your love. 
And so I was looking up some stats. Stats say this. In our world, 4.4 billion people in the world don't feel loved. 4.4 billion. That's 60% of the population of this earth do not feel that they're loved in any possible way. And I get it. It's not easy to love haters. It's not easy to love the enemy, right? God, Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully you. It ain't easy to do all those things. But how many know that it is foundational to everything? For example, when you read, and we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 13 in a minute, but when you read 1 Corinthians uh, 11 and 12, Paul was teaching the church, okay? So he's teaching his students all about the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He's teaching them worship. He's teaching them generosity. He's teaching them all these amazing things, prophecy. Come on, laying hands on the sick. And they're all like, yes, we love it. Love. And how many of that's some cool stuff? We teach that here, right? We teach all the gifts of the Holy Spirit at Elevate Church. And people are like, yay, and, and words of knowledge, and words of wisdom, and 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 prophesying and and evangelists and pastors and and preachers and prof you name it we teach it we love it so paul is teaching this and the people are eating it up they're like i love this i can walk in the power of the holy spirit i can lay hands on someone who's sick and they recover they're healed i can go and prophesy a word over someone and all of a sudden it comes to pass and it's like yay i'm so gifted stay with me Stay with me. I'm so, I'm so smart. I'm so anointed. I'm so talented. But here's the problem. The reason that the Apostle Paul kind of had to go, hmm, we have a problem. I taught these students something, and now they idolize their own gift. They idolize and they've now become so selfish, so self-centered, so egotistic, so prideful, so arrogant. Here was the problem, that though they were walking in the power of God, though they were walking in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, though they were walking in the profound communication of God, you know what they were struggling with? They all were divided against themselves. They were talking about each other. They were hating on each other. Come on, they were backbiting each other. And Paul said, we got a problem. And that's why he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So it's like the church today. We love teaching all those things, success and, and prosperity and, and elevate. And those are good. And, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. But how many know that it does you no good if the foundation isn't love? If there's no love, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how intelligent you are. I don't care how much scripture you know. If there is no love for people, if there is no compassion bleeding out of our life, then all of it is just noise. Let's look at this. Are you guys ready? Say it with me. I'm going back to school. Of love. How many know it's human love to hate, but it's divine to love? It's, it's human to hate. It's our nature. We, we weren't born with love. No, it, our nature is to hate people. Look at our world today. Look at our country. Our country is filled with hatred. Christians, listen, when you start arguing about politics, you are diving into the pool of hatred. It divides us. It destroys us. Jesus said, and people will know me by how you love one another not by how you hate one another how you despise one another how you envy one another how you talk about one another God says they'll know me by how you love one another that's how they're going to know Jesus outside of that is flesh so it's our human nature but look at this here's the test of divine love first Corinthians chapter 13 quick are you ready Let's do this thing. He says, suppose I speak in the languages of human beings or of angels. If I don't have love, I'm only a loud what? Gong. Or a noisy what? Symbol. Let, let, let's just look at this, this, this gong real quick. Quickly, go ahead. Say. That's your worship. So, so check this out. We can stop that. So, so 
we, we come to church and we're worshipers, right? Because that's what, that's what the apostle uh, Paul taught the disciples, how to worship. So they're worshiping, but then they open their big mouth. And it's just, it's like a gong. It's just a symbol, right? And we have so many people today that are good at the outward expression. We worship God. We praise God. We say, how you doing, sister? God bless you. But inside of our heart, it's dirty. It's messy. It's evil. We look at people and we, we, we judge. We're prejudiced. We stereotype. And how many know that everybody here, including myself, we all have a little bit of prejudice in us. Amen? Amen. Yeah, don't, don't be like, oh, I don't do that. Oh, praise God. You liar. <laughs> you liar. You're a liar. Everyone here has shown or displayed some form of prejudice, stereotype, or you've said something that was stupid, right? Like, like you didn't, like in your heart of hearts, you didn't really mean to say that, but out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. And so, yes, I get it. The mouth speaks some stuff, but sometimes we have to get back and we have to retract what we said. And that is the true form of repentance. So he says, I'm going to drink some tea. It ain't coffee for you haters out there. Why does pastor get coffee inside the church? I've had those people say that to me. Okay. I love you. If I, look at this. If I don't have love, I'm loud. Suppose I have the gift of prophecy. Suppose I can understand all the secret things of God and know everything about him. And suppose I have enough faith to move mountains. If I don't have love, I'm nothing at all. Come on, you can have every gift. I can prophesy. I can, I can preach. I can communicate. I, 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 can, I can pray in the spirit. I speak in tongues. Come on, I got faith to move mountains. But if I don't have love, I am am nothing to God nothing how many know people ask well then how is it that God still allows someone to operate in the gift because God does not lie God promises what he promised God does not withhold what he said you and I would walk in where we fail is we fail to have the foundation called love we got to get back to the basics church I'm nothing at all. Suppose I give everything I have to poor people. And suppose I give myself over to difficult life so I can brag. If I don't have love, I get nothing at all. You can, you can be a martyr. You can give your life for the gospel, but still be rude and arrogant and prideful. And that means nothing to God. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not want what belongs to others. It does not brag. It does, it's not proud. It does not dishonor other people. You know what dishonor other people is when you think you're better than them. When you dishonor other people, you treat them like below you. No, no. To honor people, you treat them the way you want to be treated. It does not easily become angry. It does not keep track of other people's wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but it is full of joy when the truth is spoken. Love is not happy with evil. What does that mean? When you see your enemy fall and you're like, good, that's evil. You're more evil than the evil the person created. When you want to see them go down, that's evil. When you say things like this, I can't wait till they, till they fire my boss, you're evil. I can't wait to this. I hope, I hope my coworker gets fired. I'm so sick of her. She's a loud mouth. No, you're the loud mouth. You're the symbol. You're the noise. Because love covers the multitude of sins. Love will cast out all fear. Love will never what? Fail. It never fails. But what happens to us? We become so fleshly. Let's keep going. But it is full of joy when the truth is spoken. It is full of what? Joy. When what? The truth is spoken. Someone asks you, hey, tell me, what do you think about this? You tell them the truth, now they're mad at you. But wait a minute. You just asked me, what did I think about that? I told you what I really thought. See, the thing is that you don't like the truth. 
You just want to hear what you want to hear. And unless you hear what you want to hear, now you're unhappy with what you heard. Isn't that Christians today? They want to hear what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. Like this message, you may be sitting here like, man, well, that's not me because I'm loved. No, you're not. We're all, we're all jacked up. My son preached on Wednesday. We're all jacked up. It always protects. It always trusts. Dang, that's hard, huh? It's hard to trust people. How do I gain trust back with people? Don't trust them. What the? Yeah, trust God. Then you can trust people. It always hopes. It never gives up. Never gives up. How many know that love is a verb? Love is an action, right? It's, it's, not, it's not a standalone word that sounds so beautiful. No, love goes to action. Love goes to work. As a matter of fact, let me show you the love does. Put that up. Love does and love does not. Can I just go through a few of these with, real, real quick with you? Okay, so love does walk in patience. Let's start with walk in patience. How many know that patience is tested most often by the people in your life? You know, it's not even the people on the street. Yeah, drivers, they test us here and there, but it's like whatever. You don't know them. You, you know, some of you just flip them off and whatever, you know. But I have learned this. When God is ready to promote you, he will send someone that will hate you. That's the test. And, and listen, please get this today. What do you mean God, God is sending the haters? No, God is using the haters for the test. God will use what the devil meant for bad. He says, I'll turn it around and I'm going to use it for something good. So whatever it is that you're facing, God says, I'm going to use it. God doesn't waste anything you face. So when God's ready to promote you, God's going to send the hater. Why? Because love walks in patience. And think about it. If you can't be patient with people, how are you going to be patient with the thing that you want God to entrust you with? How are you going to, how, are, how is God going to trust you with patience when things get difficult, when you're stepping into a new season? Seasons require patience. And without patience, you'll live frustrated. So God has to do his part and God has to start working on that area of patience. And I can remember clearly, I remember having a, 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 a boss who was a hater on steroids. Could not stand me because I was a Christian. And man, let me tell you, this boss man, he was a jerk. Man, he was like the lowest of the lowest in how he treated me. And I never forget every single time he would put me down, say something negative. You know, nothing was ever good. And even though we were the number one store in the entire company, man, I had like all the numbers, all the measures to say, man, we are, we are the best of the best. But it was never good enough. And every single time this boss would come out and say something stupid, I had to just deal with my tongue, bite it, and just say, ah. Oh. But you know what I would do? I would start showering him in love. And when I would respond with, like, okay, uh, we'll do better, it would piss him off. And that made me even feel better, right? I'm like, yes. Like, okay, that's good. Okay, that's the love thing. I like this love thing. I was trying to find the benefit out of the love thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay. And, and little, listen, slowly but surely, Love covered the multitude of his sins. And I led him to Jesus later on. He got fired later, but that's okay. That was his deal. My deal was to love. And, and, and I led him to Jesus Christ. But I'll, I'll be honest with you. If, if, if you're ready for promotion, then get ready for test. Because there is no promotion without a test. There's a test of character. There's a test of patience. There's a test of integrity. There's a test of whether or not you're going to give up and quit. There's a test if you're going to run or not. We got a lot of runners in the body of Christ. The moment they don't like something, they run. They gossip. They slander. They, they blame it on the church. They blame it on the pastor. They blame it on the leadership. Listen, no, 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 no. Maybe God has put those kind of people in your life to refine you, to address you. Amen? And, uh, and, and of course, and, and long story short, when, when, I, when I had passed that test, that's when I got promoted and went into ministry. Like God, so God was like, I wonder if I can, see, if I can trust you with this ugly person, then I can definitely trust you with church people. 
It's true, right? Okay, how about walk in kindness? We're never more like Jesus until we treat people like with kindness, amen? We're, we're never more like Jesus until we treat people with kindness. Um, I remember when we were at youth camp recently, um, I went and um, into this little mini market and I was putting all my, my, my groceries on the, on the, uh, the counter there and there was this, this old guy behind me and he's like, wow, man. He's like, why don't you put mine on there? And I said, okay, go ahead. And he, and he said, and, and listen, his eyes welled up with tears and he's like, why? I'm like, because you asked for it. And I said to him, listen, the Bible says that you have not because you asked not. I said, and you asked me. And so I'm here to tell you that the answer is yes, put your groceries on there. And this guy was so touched with the kindness that he said this. He said, no one has ever showed me this kind of kindness. And then he went on to say, I'm a veteran. He's like, I fought at the, in the Vietnam War. And he started telling me about all his friends that he lost and that died and that now he's living in Lake Hughes and, and you know, he doesn't have any family. But I'm telling you. When you show that kindness, when you bleed kindness, like the next time you're in the supermarket, the next time you're at a coffee shop, the next time you're at a restaurant, what if you just displayed some kindness and said, you know what, I'm going to pay for that table right there. I, I got this, this coffee person's drink. I got, I got them. Or if you're in the, the drive through coffee, hey, I'm going to pay for the next two cars. Dang. You know, it's not for them. It's not to showboat what you're doing. It's to bring you back to the walk of kindness. It's the walk of love. It's walking it, out, walking it out, not talking about it, right? Let's not just talk about it. Let's walk it out, and let's do it when no one's watching. Huh? Let's do it when nobody's watching. Like, man, no one knows that you're kind until they hang out with you, right? Rejoice in truth. What does that mean? In other words, you're not suspicious. The problem is this, is that we hate truth that makes us feel we have to repent. When we come to our truth, we hate it. Why? Because you know now you're responsible for it. You got to repent to God and you got to repent to people. Please forgive me for my stupidness. I'm so sorry. We hate it because we have to humble ourselves. We have to come down from the, 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 the ladder of pride, the ladder of ego and come down and say, I missed it. I'm so sorry. So truth brings you to the place of hate. That's the reality. It really does. Love always protects, love always trusts, love always hopes. It always perseveres. When God is ready to change you, he will ask you to do something you hate. Let me say that again. When God is ready to change you, he's going to ask you to do something you hate. Why? Because that's where you start learning how to persevere, the very thing you don't want to do. What are you hating right now? Or who are you hating right now? Because God's going to use that situation, that person, right, to change you. They may not change, but guess who changes? You change. When you allow people to control how you feel, when you let people get under your skin, now they become Lord and master of your life. They control your buttons, whether you like it or not. Here's another one. He says, love never gives up. In the book of Ecclesiastes, you see all the things that God says. Uh, he says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. There's a time for war and there's a time for peace. There's a time to eat and there's a time to not eat. There's a time for uh, living and there's a time for dying. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. And, and it keeps going on and on and on. Do you realize if you read all those verses of there's a time for everything, but the only thing that you will find that there's never a time to give up on people. There's a time for everything but giving up. You're not giving up. We can't. Love does not envy people. Love does not boast about itself, pride itself over others, dishonor people, seek selfish desires, Get easily offended. Let me see all my offended people that are always offended. No, don't lift your hand. Okay. This pastor was sharing. This is a funny story. You got to hear this one. Um, there's this uh, pastor that was sharing with us in a meeting, and he said, yeah, he's like, we did this big uh, Easter play, and, and it was, you know, uh, all, they had camels, and like, they have a big church. Like 2,000 people were going to this show. And, and he said that, uh, that all their actors are paid. 
They pay because they do it first class. And so this, this Jesus actor was carrying the cross and he's going across the stage doing his part for this big scene. And the pastor says, and there happened to be a heckler that night. And the heckler was heckling Jesus, the actor. And Jesus was going and this guy's just going and going and going. The actor Jesus drops the cross, goes off the stage and punches the guy in the face. And he gets back on stage, picks up his cross, and he goes back into his character. And the pastor says that after the show, he said, hey, listen, Jesus, I can't have you hitting our audience, man. I can't have you hurting the people that are coming. He's like, but, but he, was, he was cussing at me. He was spitting at me. He was yelling at me. He was making fun at me. And the pastor's like, yes, Jesus. I wonder how many actors we have in the church. We act like, oh my God, yes. But deep inside, you hate. You can't stand people. You can't stand a person. Every time you see them, you have, if, I always tell people, the only way that you know that you've forgiven someone is if you can be in the same room with the person and nothing shakes you inside. If you walk in the presence of that person and it still bothers you, you haven't forgiven. You're still offended. Amen? Amen. Keep record of other sins. Come on, we got Christians that are good bookkeepers in the house. Come on, they keep record of everything they've done wrong. Enjoy people's failures. Listen, change is the only acceptable apology to God. That's it. Change. Zechariah, and I'll end with this, says this, I will put this third in the fire. I will make them as pure as silver. I will test them like gold. They will call out to me and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. Let me tell you something. How do we start dealing with this, this love? You have to be in the presence of fire. What does that mean? If you be, read the book of Revelation, it says that the eyes of Jesus are like fire. And when he looks at you, it's like purification to the soul. The Bible says that he will test you like fire. Let's, let's, can I give a chemistry demonstration here? If I can get a lighter that works, be awesome. Thank you. Awesome. All right, check this out. You guys like that? Okay, check this out. Jesus. I'm not washing anyone's feet, don't worry. So, put Zechariah back on, please. I will put this third in the fire. I will make them what? Pure. And how many know it's the heart that has the issue? So God's saying, my word is water, but my fire purifies. It's like it's like purifying silver. It's like purifying the best of the best of the gold. See, gold is not gold until it's been put through fire. Why? Fire removes all the dross off the, the gold, and then you get to the purest of the purest of the purest gold. And so God says, I want you to be in my water, my word, and then I want you to take my fire. And then he purifies and you'll start taking off the things that are dirty inside. You'll start taking out the things that you've been dealing with, all the, the pain, the hurt. You got, listen, instead of waiting for someone to come and apologize to you, how about just forgive them? How about stop holding it? Stop waiting because you can wait for a very long time for someone to come back and say, you know what? You were so right. I was wrong. You were right. Well, you're going to wait for a very long time. We got to come back to love. It's the foundation. If you don't have that, you're noise. You're just noise. Ah, who wants to hear noise? We got to bleed love. We got to bleed forgiveness. We got to bleed repentance. We got to bleed it, God. I I'm wrong. Stand to your feet. Thank you. I want you to grab your little communion cup. 
And as we take this and as we leave, I, I want you to, to leave with this. See, it doesn't matter how you walked in. What matters is how you're going to walk out today. And I pray that this week, that we as Elevate Church would start a love revolution. That before you leave this house, that you would love someone here. See, if you can't love those that are in your house, you'll never love those that are outside this house. If you just walk in, walk out, that says a lot about you. No, we're the love church. Don't be weird either, okay? Don't be like, oh, like, hey, come here, let me hug you, hold you. No, don't do, don't do that. That's weird. But, but, but you know what? But we can encourage someone today. Come on, who are you going to see today? Maybe a family member, a friend. Maybe you're going to go eat breakfast somewhere. Maybe you're going to go to a coffee shop after this. Maybe you're going to go somewhere and hang out with people. What if you just started making it an intentional point to say, I'm going to say three nice things about this person. I don't like them much, but I'm going to say it anyways. See, your true friends, they find the potential in you. The enemy finds the worst in you. So I want to be the person that finds the potential in everyone. The enemy will point out your sin. The friend will point out the potential. That's why Jesus said, when you take communion, remember me. Remember how I forgave you. Remember how I loved you in your darkest sin. Remember how I forgave you. Remember how I treated you. Remember how I healed you. Remember how I loved you. Remember how I showed myself true to you. And God says this, and now do the same. So as you take communion, you're literally saying, Lord, I need to remember that the foundation of everything in my life is your love. And without it, I'm just noise. And so I pray that this is all of our prayer. Lift your, your bread and say, Heavenly Father, I receive this bread knowing that it's your body. Your body was broken for me so that I could be made whole. Make me whole in my heart. Make me whole in my mind. Make me whole in my love. Jesus, I remember what you did for me. Help me to do it for others. I receive your bread. I receive your body. And I receive my wholeness. In Jesus' name, go ahead and take that. Grab your juice. And say, Heavenly Father, I remember today that Jesus was stripped. He was torn. He was ripped. His blood was shed. He was beaten, bruised, lied to, abandoned, and yet he died for me. Jesus, thank you for your precious blood. It's what washes me of my sins. It's your agape love, your unconditional love that forgives me and covers me, protects me of all my sins. Today I receive it, my forgiveness. I also forgive those who have hurt me. I forgive my, forgive my spouse. I forgive my children. I forgive my boss. I forgive the coworkers I work with. Lord, I forgive the people in my house, the people in my church. I forgive them, Father. And I take this cup that symbolizes your blood and I receive the washing of my soul in Jesus name go ahead and take them if today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today